Richard Chivangelis, and I will be giving the empirical version of the Jay's talk uh, with my partner James Chem, um, which is which is coincidental. Where's a clicker? Thank you. So for those of you that don't know me, I grew up in Markham, Ontario, and I've been in the barrier for a while now. But it's honestly, I would be homesick if not for machine intelligence. And the reason is because there's just such a wealth of talent. Uh, and I get to work with the incredible people at University of Toronto and University of Alberta. That brings me back home about 10 times a year. So thank you, AI, for my general life happiness. Um, one other fun fact, uh, Minister Baines actually taught me a very interesting lesson by accident about Canadian government. Uh, the first time I met him, he was wearing these bright, bright, bright orange sneakers, and they were super, super cool. Uh, you could see him from a mile away, and what that ended up teaching me was Canadian government is willing to take calculated risks that pay off because he looked fantastic. <laughs> and so... Just uh, an intro to uh, what we do. We're Bloomberg Beta. We're an early stage venture capital fund that's solely focused on investing in founders that are transforming the future of work for the good. And within that, we became obsessed with this area of machine intelligence. Um, and, and why that happened was sort of, you know, personal experience of, of me and the other folks at the where, you know, we're knowledge workers just like probably most of the people in this room. And there was this subset of technologies emerging, and the ones that had this sort of magical feel, they were making workflows more seamless, they were giving, giving us new types of intelligence. We're like, what really is it about this subset of technologies? And this is dating back about four years ago now. We realized, you know, it's really, it's really the technologies that are using learning algorithms that are the one that have this special panache. Um, and so that led to, you know, we're kind of a nerdy analytical fund doing this just deep dive into the world of machine intelligence to see just how much, um, you know, it was affecting the rest of the world. Um, and so what I want to do is three things very quickly. Um, want to walk you through the history. So we've published a machine intelligence report in 2014. We did one in 2015, and we're going to give you a sneak preview of what's coming up in 2016. Um, we want to give you a bit of a framework for how to think about this day. And we want to make sure that all of the corporate folks in the audience that are thinking about machine intelligence for the first time have a really good framework for how to do that. My colleague James Chan will step up to do that. So 2014, how many of you have seen some sort of version of this chart? Oh, wow. First time I've ever felt like a celebrity. Let's get it. Um, so the thing that surprised us in 2014, you know, really went into this heads down wondering, are people using this technology, and if so, what are they using it for? And the overarching takeaway from this slide was, oh, my goodness, there's already a lot happening. Uh, and, and the other thing that surprised us was just the breadth of activity. You're seeing it affecting every vertical. Um, and one of the things that happens when you publish a whole bunch of these reports is you end up getting a whole bunch of inbound from people that are interested. And, and what happened in 2014 with the inbound it was primarily angry founders that weren't on the, the landscape, so we fixed that. Uh, but there was one really, really, really good thing that happened from it, and I wouldn't be here today if it, if it weren't for the future-looking efforts of Ajay Agarwal. So in between all these angry founder emails, I get this email that says, hey, Siobhan, I know we've only met briefly once. You're working on this machine intelligence thing. Can you come teach my MBAs about it? And I was like, well, sure, any excuse to go to Toronto, but... You know, do you, are you sure you want to teach MBAs about this? And I, I'm sure they haven't even heard of machine learning yet. And he's like, well, you know, that's true, but I really think that this trend is going to be bigger than anybody realized. You're going to have a whole bunch of technologists coming up, and what's not going to be there is going to be the business leaders that can help accelerate these technologies. And he was absolutely right. So the, the machine learning uh, cohort this year for the Creative Destruction Lab has 50 companies, and one of the most magical things that I found about the program that doesn't really exist anywhere else is you've got these incredible technical founders that are being paired with these business leaders that have a savviness in, in machine intelligence, which, which is kind of this beautiful marriage. So jumping forward to 2015, two big takeaways here. One is volume activity in the startup ecosystem exploded for sure. This is a, a much busier chart that's showing a much um, smaller subset of what's actually happening in machine intelligence. And the second bit here was it was the first time we saw the emergence of autonomous systems. And so, you know, self-driving cars, um, auto, autopilot drones, things like industrial machinery starting to move in a more human and dynamic way. And then the software corollary of that was we saw these agents. And so the way to think about the agents, or if you want to be mean, you can call them chatbots. I think they're more than that. Um, is you have these pieces of software that can actually understand us in some ways, transact for us, and act in intertemporal ways. And so that, that was the first time we saw the emergence there. 
And so dating up to 2016, you guys get the sneak peek. We're not publishing until next week, but this is the, the home team advantage. Um, the big, big, big difference, and Ajay, you alluded to this in your talk, was I do think this is the inflection point year. And the reason I think that, at least from sort of a broad-based machine intelligence perspective, is we get thousands and thousands of inbound messages as a result of these landscapes. And there's been a stark contrast in the type of person who's reaching out. So in the first landscape, it was mostly founders and academics. Then there were investors that started becoming interested. And for the last year, it's been primarily corporate executives trying to figure out exactly how they're going to bring machine intelligence capabilities to their own corporations. And so for this year's landscape, it really comes with an eye for, OK, how do I actually do this? And so here's what we've got going here. Um, it's, it's a rough draft, so for, forgive any misalignments. But the way to think about this is in, is, is in three parts. And so you've got that top part there. Don't share it, Steve. <laughs> He's already got it published on his blog. It's quick conversion. <laughs> uh, so we've got, if you look at the top two bars, we've got enterprise intelligence and enterprise functions. And, and that's essentially answering the question of how do you bring machine intelligence to your own workforce? And one of the big things this year is on the hand side, and James is going to speak to this in more detail, is people are trying to figure out how to build these capabilities internally. And it is not easy. So we're trying to create this one-stop shop on the right-hand side for all of the tools you're going to need if you're going to give this a shot. Uh, and then the third piece, with, which James will also talk about, is there are a lot of complexities for how to go to market with a lot of these technologies. And the best thing we can do right now is learn lessons from others who are taking, who are taking these technologies to industry. And why do I have all of these boxes colored in yellow? Well, I have good news for you. So between the CDL classes you can see at lunch, uh, CDL companies you can see at lunch and our speakers today, we have 31 of 34 categories of machine intelligence covered. So good news is you can go home at the end of the day and tell all your colleagues you're 91% covered. 9% um, is on your own. I'm just going to quickly jump into this before handing it over to James. And this is the idea of you know, most of the corporates we talk to, their first experiences with machine intelligence are using applications to empower their workforce. And this is coming primarily in two flavors. And so if you take a look at the top bar, that's the enterprise intelligence bar. These are data type specific providers, right? So if you take a look at the left hand side, you've got people using visual data to provide new types of intelligence. Uh, and one example of that, we, we made an investment in a company called Orbital Insight that basically said, wow, macroeconomic indicators kind of suck. You know, governments are taking them. They're not timely. They're often not accurate. What do we have access to now? We have access to high-resolution satellite data and these great computer vision algorithms. So why don't we take our best guess at recreating macroeconomic indicators in real time? And if you move over, you've got things like audio data, which up until you know, about a year, year and a half ago, that data was not usable for anything. We didn't have machine transcription um, services that could basically distill that information in an economical way. Um, but now we do. And what does that mean? That means you can actually use all of the audio data at your enterprise to empower human performance. The second flavor of this is the companies that are going specifically for an enterprise function. Uh, and the one, the one I like to bring up just because it's fairly vivid, we had Kieran, the founder of Textio, speak here last year. And what she's building is the, the problem she's solving is we're basically all publishers now. There's a lot of domain-specific text we have to create. And sometimes we're not an expert. So pretty much everyone in this audience, I'm sure, has had to write a job description at some point in their life. Um, but not, I, at least I don't feel like I'm an expert at doing that. And so what she said is we're going to create this embedded text editor that's going to learn from tens and hundreds of thousands of job descriptions how well they did and basically teach the algorithms um, you know, what led to very good outcomes, what didn't lead to good outcomes, and how can we back into what text will actually work, work most seamlessly. And, and I would encourage anyone who's just wrapping their heads around how machine intelligence can really affect the life of a non-technical person to go and play around with that tool. Because the whole point is you don't actually have to understand how the algorithms work to get a better outcome. And so with that, I'm going to hand you over to James, who's going to teach you about the lovely world of building machine intelligence internally. Great. Thanks, Javon. Um, and actually, to correct you, I'm not going to talk in more detail. I'm going to actually talk in much less detail at a very, very high level. Because I think what we found is that as we've talked to people who are interested in machine intelligence, we've often found that you get lost into a bewildering stack and a bewildering set of questions around what am I actually building. And oftentimes, you will think, um, gosh, I should invest in a data science organization without actually understanding what it is. And so now for those who are trying to figure out what is data science, data science is either one, a statistician who gets paid $50,000 more, 
or it is a group of software developers who do very bad statistics. And so um, that's, and we are really in that world right now where people are trying to figure out, so as I am interested in machine intelligence, what do I actually do and how should I think about it? Um, I think Ajay and Josh and Avi are doing, like, I think, incredible work around helping to think about it. And let me give you an even more simplistic view that, um, that Pedro and others will not like, but I suspect will be quite helpful as a set of abstractions. So let me go to the beginning of the world. Um, it, about 70 years ago, a set of really smart folks realized that it turns out software is much easier to write when you separate code from data. It turns out to be a great idea. And, um, and you know, sort of the world we live in now, though, is a world in which we have code, but we have lots of data. And to be honest, managing it is really terrible. And, um, and lots of you sp spend lots of money um, either gathering or cleaning or managing that data. And as you think about that, you'll say to yourself, well, surely there's something we can do around better predictions, or we can do, um, uh, you know, sort of generate algorithms that will be magical. And let me tell you, these algorithms are not magical, and it is helpful to think about these algorithms as models. Models is, you know, I, I think for folks with a history in statistics, you'll remember that um, all models are, are wrong and some are useful. And I think the key here is to understand that if you think of models as, um, in this case, um, models are code that ends up being generated by other code by taking in a bunch of data. And that's all you have to think about. And you know, out of that comes a whole set of very interesting problems. Um, one of them is that uh, it turns out these models are not like traditional software. Your IT group usually tells you they can test things. They're usually lying. But in case of models, they really can't test anything. It's really, really different. It's really, really different. And even the best model makers in the world right now are still figuring out, cons figuring out consistent ways to understand how to even think about QA. And that has big implications for how much you should trust the model and what, what you should do with it. And then I'll be honest, um, uh, in, you know, in the case of code, I could always at least step through things and pretend that I understood it. Um, in, in the case of many of these models, they are going to be hard to actually understand, and in some cases, kind of impossible. Now, I think there are a number of folks in this room who are, make, are hoping that they will make it, some of these models easy to understand, but I'm not, it's not entirely clear that we'll be able to do that. And so models are just very different than software, or, or sort of traditional software, and we are going to live in a world where there are going to be a lot of models. And what's interesting about this is, um, you know, sort of we will often talk about models learning, or we'll talk about machine learning, and I think that's helpful, but I think the better way to think about it is your models are going to iterate over time, right? And, and it's going to iterate based on new ways about thinking about generating the model and also new sets of data that you get in order to um, build slightly better models. And here's the thing. Um, those models uh, applied incorrectly will be wrong, and those models over time, uh, as you get new data, could could improve dramatically, but they could also subtly go very, very wrong. And that creates all sorts of questions about how should you actually manage these models. And I think for most organizations, the question should be, um, where, what models do I invest in? And where should I deploy them? To what extent do I trust them? To what extent do I decide to iterate on them quickly? And now, for most organizations, I think then the question is, um, what are these models and what should they look like? And I think the right way to think about it is then to look at other industries and business models in which people are starting to deploy these prediction models and to, to figure it out. And so we've started to map that out. Um, we're, I think this is the start of a conversation. I think we're all in the process of trying to grasp around how to talk about this. Um, we welcome further conversation from both cranks and smart people. Thanks. <laughs>